This morning we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse number 23. There is significance, significant importance in the church observing the Lord's Supper. Not to diminish all that is going on in our world by way of COVID-19, but Jesus' church has assembled together to observe the Lord's Supper in circumstances much more uh, severe than what we are even being faced with today. Over the last number of weeks, the Lord would continue to remind me as I was praying, as I was reading His Word, He would continue to remind me of 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, or ch chapter 11, verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. As the church assembles together to have this time of, that we celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion as it may be called, this gives testimony to all the Lord has done, to who He is. I'm reminded, as we have this time together, I'm reminded of a young man who was here in this sanctuary just a few short years ago, and as we passed around the communion um, elements, this young man went home, and he had further questions afterwards for his mother. And his mother opened up the Bible and led that young man to the Lord after we had observed the Lord's Supper. I'm reminded of another young lady who was here in this sanctuary. She was upset that she could not observe the Lord's Supper. She had not made a profession of faith and been baptized, and her family rightly made the decision that she would not participate in the Lord's Supper. She went home. She was upset about this. Her dad opened up the Word of God. She saw in the Word of God her sinfulness, and she saw Jesus and the sacrifice He made for sin, and she was saved. So you see, as we assemble together for the Lord's Supper, it is a time for the church to reflect on the significance. It is a time for the church to, to sit and allow the Spirit of God to examine our hearts as we remember why we are here. It is also an opportunity for the church to give testimony to the, to the world and even to those in the congregation who may not be believers of exactly what it means when Jesus gave His body and His blood in atonement for our sins. I hope you have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 11. We'll begin at verse number 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes." Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you. That in the midst of a world filled with confusion, dishonesty, dishonesty, and falsehood, Father, we can look to your word and know that it is true because you are the author and you are truth. Father, in the midst 
of a time, Lord, where we are, are grasping, trying to figure out, Lord, what to do and how to handle situations. We thank you for your word that it is sufficient. We can turn to your word and see how we are to live. Father, I pray today as we open up your word, Father, I pray that you would speak to your church. Lord, that you would strengthen us. Lord, that you would remind us of the sacrifice Jesus has made. Father, I pray as we open up your word today, Lord, that if there's anyone here in this sanctuary, Lord, that is still living in sin apart from you, Father, I pray that today would be the day that they would see the sacrifice Jesus has made, his life for theirs and they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that in this moment, Lord, that you would increase, Lord, that your church would hear from you, and that I would decrease. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look to these verses today, we'll see the institution of the Lord's Supper, the way the Lord Jesus designed it to be observed we'll see the consequences of taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, and then we'll close with the correct approach to observing the Lord's Supper. If you look in your Bible to verse number 23, we'll see the institution of the Lord's Supper. The Bible says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Paul had founded this church in Corinth some six years before this letter was written. He had stayed there for approximately 18 months to get them settled in and get them on the right track. And naturally, the church began to drift. They began to drift from the teachings of Scripture, and they began to engage in disunity. There was deception there was selfishness taking place, and there was a neglect amongst the church for those who did not have. Paul brings them back, and he takes them right back to the upper room. He brings them right back to that night that Jesus was observing the Passover with his disciples, where Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Paul is correcting the church in Corinth using the very words of Jesus. He's pointing them to the very authority of Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now there are some religious groups that falsely understand what the Lord's Supper is. They believe that the crackers and the juice are the actual and literal body and blood of Jesus. That is not true. The crackers are crackers. The juice is juice. What is important is what they symbolize. That is what is important as we have this time together. As we look to the cracker and we were reminded of Jesus' body as he gave his body for our life. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. In verse number 25, Paul continues with the words of Jesus in order to get the Corinthians back on the right track. The Bible says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The covenant symbolizes an agreement between man and God. In the old covenant, men and, men and women would bring animals. They would be sacrificed for the shedding of the blood. For the forgiveness of sin. We see here in the Lord's Supper portraying and symbolizing what Jesus did in securing for us the new covenant. It was Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross 
that made way for the new covenant. It was Jesus' once for all atoning sacrifice that eliminated the need ever again for animals to be brought to the altar to be sacrificed. Jesus paid the penalty for each one of us. The Bible says in Hebrews 8, 6, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. The Bible gives us further instruction in verse number 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. As we have this time together as a church to partake of the bread and the juice, we are proclaiming the Lord. We are reminding the world of who Jesus is and what He came to accomplish. We're looking at Jesus not merely as a great teacher, not merely as the perfect example we are looking at Jesus the way John the Baptist did when he saw him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus gave his body and his blood for our salvation. That is why we observe this, the Lord's Supper. That is what this time symbolizes the Lord's Supper provides a visual representation of the gospel. Because we are reminded as we observe this time of the Lord's Supper that Jesus came, born of a virgin. Jesus was without sin. Not one time did Jesus think, say, or do anything sinful. He was the only one that could go to the cross and make a payment for us that would atone, I meaning it would satisfy the Father's holy wrath against sin. And He went there for you. He went there for me. He went there for the sin of the world. To the church in Corinth, they were greedy and self-centered. They were not proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes as they were gathering together in sin. As we observe the Lord's Supper this morning, I would encourage you to meditate on these passages of Scripture. Think about their significance. Remind yourself this morning in a brand new way of the significance of Jesus' sacrificial death. Reminding us that His death made available to us salvation. That His death made available to us reconciliation with the Father. As He was buried in the tomb and three days later He rises again. He is alive today. This very truth provides to us the security of eternal life to those who believe. The Bible says in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Without that, without placing your faith in the finished work of Christ and what He did on the cross, you are not at peace with God. The only way to be at peace with God is through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul reminds the Corinthians the real meaning of the Lord's Supper. Next, Paul speaks to the consequences of taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Look to your Bible, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, in verses 18 through 22, Paul had reminded the church in Corinth of where they had gone off track. He was reminding them that there was disunity, there was deception, there was selfishness. All of these things were taking place. And Paul was reminding them and us that the Lord's Supper must be taken in a worthy manner. We cannot take it in an unworthy manner. So the consequence, the first consequence we see in the Scripture 
when one takes the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, is you are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. In modern language, we would say you will answer to God for this. How we observe the Lord's Supper, we will give an answer to God for how we do that. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? To avoid this guilt of taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, we're told in verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. How often do we come in and we see the elements, we see the crackers, we see the juice, and we give little thought to what we are about to engage in. We give little thought to the significance of what is about to take place. As we come together for this time of observing the Lord's Supper, we must place ourselves under the focus of the Holy Spirit. We must allow the Holy Spirit to use the Word of God to make us aware and clearly understand what we are engaging in today. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. It is good for the believer to examine themselves. Examine ourselves according to the Scriptures, not according to the standards of this world. Verse 29, we see the next consequence. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The second consequence, according to the Scriptures, is you will bring judgment upon yourself. Now, for the believer, this is not eternal judgment. This is a physical, temporal judgment. It's described clearly in the next verse. But before we get there, we have to ask the question, What does the term not discerning the Lord's body mean? Quite simply, it means not taking this time seriously. Not reflecting and giving the seriousness to the Lord's Supper that it demands. The Bible tells us in verse 30, For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Consequence 3, we see you will face the discipline from God the Lord. Now many have tried to look at this verse and soften it up. They've tried to say, well, what this means is you'll have a weak and lifeless faith. Folks, that's not true. What this verse says is what it means. And it tells us there were real people in Corinth that did not take the Lord's Supper seriously. And they were sick, physically sick. There were others in Corinth that did not take the Lord's Supper seriously. And the Bible says many sleep. Throughout the Bible, that means many have died. There were those in Corinth that God had brought judgment upon because they were His children. And as the Bible says in Hebrews 12, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chasing of the Lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. You see, there were those in Corinth that did not take the Lord's Supper seriously. And God disciplined them before they brought further judgment upon themselves, before they brought shame upon his church. So understanding the consequences that are before us as we observe the Lord's Supper, making sure we do so not in an unworthy manner, we close with the correct approach to observing the Lord's Supper. Look to the Bible, verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. The Bible offers four steps 
to the correct approach to observing the Lord's Supper. First is we are to examine ourselves. Now we will have a time very shortly to do just that. We will ask the very Spirit of God to use the Word of God and to do the necessary work on our heart to reveal unconfessed sin so that we can confess that sin and take the Lord's Supper before the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. We must examine ourselves before this time. Second, we are to accept the Lord's discipline. Look to the Bible, verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Remember, as believers, as the Lord disciplines us, it leads us to repentance. As we have that time and we receive the Lord's discipline, we repent and we are restored. The Lord Jesus said to the church in Laodicea, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So we are to accept the Lord's discipline. Thirdly, we are to have a heart to serve others. Look to verse 33. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Now in Corinth and in the first century church, they would have a meal along with their time of celebration with the Lord's Supper. And so what would happen there in Corinth is those that had means could get there earlier. And they could bring nicer meals. Those that had to work would oftentimes get there late. The food was gone. The church in Corinth, as they had this time together, there was a real distinction between those who had and those that did not have. And the Bible's telling us that should not be the case for Jesus' church. So they are reminded that as they come together to wait for one another, they are to look out for the needs of one another. They are to follow in the example of our Lord who said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So they were to have a heart to serve others. Finally, they were not to bring judgment upon themselves. Look to the Bible, verse 34. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. So Paul's advice to the church there in Corinth was for those that were in a rush to get there early so they could make sure they could get all of the best foods. He says, eat at home. That's not what the Lord's Supper is for. It is a time for the church to come together and reflect upon the sacrifice of of Jesus, to be reminded of his love for this world, that he would give his life on the cross for our sins. The Lord's Supper is an opportunity for Jesus' church to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we enter in now to a time of reflection, as we think about the significance of of what it means to observe the Lord's Supper, I'll remind you of what the psalmist said. Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You see, as we gather together this morning to observe the Lord's Supper, it provides us an opportunity for a backward look. The very nature of the Lord's Supper forces us to look back on the cross, where Jesus, the very Son of God, came to this world. He went to that cross for the sins of this world, dying there in your place and in mine, buried and rising again the third day. As we have this time of the Lord's Supper, we look back to the life of Jesus. We look back to His sacrificial death and His glorious resurrection. The Lord's Supper 
provides us the opportunity to look forward. It reminds us, in spite, in the midst of chaos and uncertainty that we face in this world, it reminds us to look forward and see, as Billy Graham was known to say, God wins. We see that Jesus makes all things new. He restores heaven and earth, and we see the uncertainty and confusion will all go away. The Lord's Supper provides us an opportunity for an outward look. We are to consider our relationship with one another. We are to consider our relationship with others and make sure there's no division. There, there's, no, uh, no, there's no friction. There's no animosity between us to make sure we're not sitting here harboring unforgiveness in our hearts. Lastly, the Lord's Supper affords us an opportunity for an inward look. It's that time where we sit still before the Lord, listen to the Scriptures, examine our hearts, we repent and confess our sins, knowing that the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins. Then we partake of the Lord's Supper. At this time, I'd like us to have that time of reflection. As I walk through some areas for us to consider, these areas are not unique to me. They're from a man by the name of Greg Frizzell. We've read his book, Returning to Holiness. It has had a, a profound impact in my life and the life of this church. But it's a reminder that we don't rush in to observing the Lord's Supper. We sit and we examine ourselves before the Lord. So if you'd bow your heads with me as I ask through these qu a series of questions, we reflect in our minds on these scriptures before we observe the Lord's Supper. The first area is my heart passion to love, know, and revere God in unceasing worship. The Bible says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Ask yourself today, is your service and witnessing for Jesus lukewarm? Do rushed and neglected prayer times reveal a lack of passion to more intimately know God? Confess and forsake all lukewarmness and lack of reverence for God and praise God for His grace. Next, my commitment to godly attitudes and thought. The Bible says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ask yourself, do I have ongoing patterns of angry, critical, or judgmental thoughts? Am I frequently dominated by anxiety, fear, or doubt instead of trust in God? Confess and forsake all sinful attitudes and thoughts. Trust God's grace for forgiveness. Next, consider godly verbal and online communication. Jesus said, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. The Bible tells us, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Ask yourself, am I prone to words that are angry, critical, or divisive? Would people describe me as kind and loving or somewhat short-tempered, critical, and negative? Confess and forsake all sins God has revealed. Thank God for His grace and trust Jesus to fill you with His purity and love. Next, right relationships and Christian unity. Jesus said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar... 
and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Finally, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Ask yourself this morning, is there anyone I have offended, past or present, yet I have not asked forgiveness? Is there anyone, past and present, that I have not forgiven from my heart? Fully confess all sins of relationship and disunity. Trust God for the grace to humble yourself and embrace full repentance. Next, yielding sins of commission. The Bible says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. The Bible says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Ask yourself, do I have persistent patterns of repeatedly confessing the same sins with no real repentance? Do I have any actions or habits that break God's commands? Confess and forsake all sins of commission. Praise God for His grace and strength to repent. Next, victory over sins of omission. Jesus said, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? The Bible says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Ask yourself, do I often neglect to spend significant time in God's word and prayer? Do I rob God by withholding my giving? Confess and forsake whatever God has revealed. Rejoice in His grace and resolve to fully repent. Finally, yielding pride and self-will, denying self, embracing the cross. Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. Ask yourself, do I continue certain actions or relationships, though I have nagging doubts they are right? Is there some area of surrender I am putting off or acting as if I am not clear on God's will, though I really am? Confess and forsake areas God has revealed. Thank God that His grace is greater than our sins. As the piano plays, we'll have a, time, a continued time of reflection and examination. The altar is open. You could pray there. You can pray where you are. If there's someone that you have wronged and you need to make it right, now is the time to do that.